the winds were changing. A storm approaching, a monk out for a walk, distracted by the distant bang of beating drums. He turns his face to the cruel, bitter wind from the north, and what he saw there made his legs buckle. What were those things? Dragons, muttered the monk. He lifted up his cassock and he hot-footed it back to the monastery. But these were not dragons, not mythical monsters, although they would become the stuff of legend. For these things were longboats, dragon ships they would be called, and on them warriors, wielding weapons of war. They approached, wielding these weapons made from murderous metals, copper, silver, iron, far superior to any metal seen by the British people. They rampaged. They killed the monks, enslaved some, but then went on rampaging through the country, murdering without mercy, taking the best arable lands and making them their own. And in time... They absorbed many of the British tribes into their own Viking clan, teaching them how to farm in the ways of their clan. And in this way, they took occupation, bringing their immigrant communities to the islands of Britain. A hundred years or so passed, a hundred years in which Viking families came over the seas and established their culture further and they brought with them their own king. By now, his name was Guthrum. Guthrum, mighty warrior, feared by even his own people. And what of the rightful king of England, Alfred? He had been forced to retreat deep into the Somerset marshes. No dragon ships for him. Here in a land of quagmire, of snaking rivers, of houses made from trees and thatch, the great king of England now paddled in modest rowing boats from settlement to settlement. Of course he still had his royal court, his chamber of men who supported him and he would gather these in the evenings and in these meetings he would rage how dare guthrum and his men take over our land we will rise brothers and sisters we will take back what is ours alfred gathered an army in the marshes but what he needed now was military, military intelligence. What were the Vikings' strengths and weaknesses? How well prepared would they be if Alfred and his men attacked? What Alfred came up with was a plan. He disguised himself as a minstrel. Some say he took a lute, others a pipe. And he left the marshes. Bypassing the fields, now worked not by British farmers, but the sons of Viking farmers. And he found his way through these fields and farms and settlements until he came to the Viking camp in which Guthrum held court. And here he waited outside an armory and listened in to a conversation between two guards. I hear the King of England is a coward and a fool, said one of the guards, that he waits like a coward in the marshes, praying to his pathetic God that we should all fall ill to some disease. I hear is nothing more than a cripple, said the other, that his weapon, weapons are weak and they buckle at one single blow from our own. Then our attack at the next full moon, said the first guard, will be his undoing. Until then, we party and rest. Alfred smiled to himself wryly. Their weakness is their arrogance, he thought to himself. 
for we will be prepared, and we shall attack before the next full moon. Alfred made his way back to the marshes and his castle there, Athelney, and he gathered his army. And well before the next full moon, he led his soldiers out of the marshes, through the fields of English corn, out of sight from the Viking camp. Alfred led a small band of elite soldiers and like silent assassins, they went into their Viking camp and there they slit throats, raided the armory by the blacksmith's forge of all the weapons and took them back to the awaiting army. And before dawn, Alfred took his soldiers, many of them on horseback, right up to the Viking camp. He raised his sword high above his head. Something about the moment, the smell of the dew, perhaps made him stop and take the moment in. Above him, the last few remaining stars were already fading. Ahead of him, the silhouette of the Viking camp, smoke and vapour rising from the first fires of the morning. The sound of crickets in the field, the bees hunting for nectar amid the wild flowers. If this is to be my last day, thought Alfred, clenching his fist, then it has been spent in my fair lands, my home, England. And then he threw his sword down to the ground and his army let out an a mighty roar and they charged. The English pigs are coming, came the call from the Viking lookout, but it was too late. Even if the armoury had not been raided, there was no time to prepare, and by noon there were rivers of blood. The dead, the dying, all around him. Alfred saw a figure being dragged towards him, his legs all but useless, his hands tied behind his back, thrown before him. Alfred looked down. Guthrum, he muttered. Do it, said his guards. Kill the king. And so Alfred took his sword. He raised it high above his head. But what Alfred did next shocked all that saw it. He lowered his sword. He did not kill Guthrum. Take this fine warrior. Take him and heal his wounds. Give him fresh clothing and heal his wounds. And when he is well, bring him back to me and we will drink and break bread. It was a gesture that floored those that supported him, but it was a gesture of great brilliance. For from that meeting, Alfred and Guthrum made this peace. They signed a treaty. Alfred offered himself as a godfather to Guthrum. He became a Christian. And though this peace did not last, it brought peace for a while. And Alfred went on to be a great king. He had books translated from Latin into English. He encouraged his people to read, to make things and trade with other countries. He hated war, but fought many of them, all of them, for the good of his country and our island of Britain. <laughs>